Okay, everyone. Um, so for those of you who weren't in uh, attendance for the panel session, uh, my name is Murray Dunker. I'm the Associate Vice President of Research and International here at the University of Waterloo. And I'm absolutely mm -hmm. delighted to welcome you here for the Friesen Lecture. Before we get underway, the University of Waterloo acknowledges that much of our work takes place on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main campus is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. Our active work towards reconciliation takes place across our campuses through research, learning, teaching, and community building, and is coordinated within our Office of Indigenous Relations. Thank you to everyone who has joined us here today for the Friesian Lecture, a special event featuring Dr. Zupakel A. Butta, and we are very pleased to be able to offer the special presentation by the recipient of the 2023 Henry G. Friesen International Prize in Health Research, awarded by Francis CIHR. At the end of the lecture, we will take questions from the audience in attendance here today, and this lecture is also being recorded and will be posted on the university's YouTube channel. First, I would like to introduce Dr. David Malkin, past president of Friends of Canadian Institutes of Health Research, to say a few words on behalf of Friends of CHR. Dr. Malkin is a professor of pediatrics uh, and medical biophysics in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto and is the CIBC Children's Foundation Chair in Child Health Research, Director of the Cancer Genetics Program, and co-lead of the Precision Child Health Initiative at the Hospital for Sick Children. In addition, he leads regional and national programs in precision oncology for children, adolescents, and young child, adult cancer patients with the aim to transform the outcomes for these patients. Dr. Malkin's research program focuses on genetic and genomic mechanisms of childhood cancer and susceptibility advances from which have led him to receive many awards and recognitions. Thank you so much, David. Works. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Dunker, and, and thanks everybody for joining. Um, for those of you who were, who, who were here for the uh, earlier uh, panel, some of my comments will be uh, virtually exactly the same, but for those who weren't, uh, uh, for, and you could bear with or look <laughs> at your phones or drink your coffee, uh, and then uh, we'll challenge you to figure out what's different. Um, so my area of research, is, as you've heard, is actually um, very, very different, it would seem, on the surface than, than uh, what we've been talking about this morning and what we'll hear more from uh, uh, Dr. Buta uh, now. Um, but uh, remarkably, the overlap is striking. And I was just speaking with um, uh, Professor Elliott uh, earlier. We're, we're developing um, uh, a test called circulating tumor DNA using a uh, very uh, simple blood test, if you will, uh, to detect DNA shed by cancers into the bloodstream and into individuals who are predisposed to cancer to see if you can pick them up earlier. And while the technology is uh, pretty high-end and uh, uh, technical, one of the aspects of the project um, that we have and uh, are rolling out is uh, engaging collaborators in uh, Jordan, South Africa, Kenya, and uh, Uganda with the idea that it's all fine and dandy to develop these technologies in North America and at, at Harvard and Toronto and Waterloo, uh, but if you can't implement them in the larger parts of the world, where there may be uh, challenges that we don't even foresee, uh, then we need to know right from the get-go. So I think there is actually a lot of overlap from what we're hearing today um, in all of medicine. So um, as, uh, as Professor Duncan mentioned, I'm speaking here very briefly on behalf of uh, Friends of CIHR, uh, which is an organization which was established about, uh, over 20 years ago now, about 23 years ago, um, to... Um, really advocate for science, particularly for uh, young investigators and students, um, uh, and, and advocate for the goals and ambitions uh, and mission of CIHR. Uh, and uh, as part of this, there has been the uh, lecture series. This is the 17th one uh, in honor of uh, Henry Friesen. And Dr. Friesen um, really launched and uh, advocated to the federal government and then launched and was the initial president of CIHR, which I think we're all familiar with. Um, 
So the uh, uh, prize itself um, is awarded on an annual basis uh, to a, a prominent individual, Canadian or international, who has contributed um, in, in uh, leadership of uh, policy, health policy, health research uh, across Canada as well as around the world. And in this way, of course, uh, Dr. Buta clearly represents uh, that. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Friesen, uh, for which the prize is established, uh, isn't able to attend today's events, but but as Dr. Buta well knows, uh, he's been traveling the country and will be uh, visiting Manitoba, uh, not in this weather. We've decided it will be sometime <laughs> in May, uh, so we, we don't have these sorts of problems. Uh, and, and Dr. Friesen already indicated to me very clearly that he's excited to, to meet and, and interact with Dr. Buta. Um, the tour, um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, so far has included uh, stops in Ottawa, uh, University of Toronto, and the amazing Global Health Day at uh, McGill University back in November and um, and finishes off uh, this year uh, as well. We've launched the nominations for just uh, a couple of days ago for the 2024 laureate uh, and uh, so you will have received that uh, somewhere in the in the mail um, or in the email rather uh, for that. Um, Brief biography of Dr. Buta was in the uh, announcement that would have been um, received publicly, and I don't want to take time away from your lecture, but just to highlight that in his long uh, and illustrious career has made innumerable seminal contributions to improving the lives of millions and millions of people, both in Canada and importantly uh, around the world as we know. And this life-saving work in the so-called first thousand days um, relates to maternal child health initiatives, which we'll hear more about, particularly in the context in nutrition, infection control, uh, and public health. But at least as importantly as all of this, and as I mentioned earlier this morning, I've gotten to know Dr. Buta, even though we do work in the same institution, uh, didn't really cross paths that much until now. And uh, during his tour of Ottawa, really recognized him uh, both as a brilliant scientist uh, in that regard, but also as a humble, compassionate man and has this insatiable scientific curiosity. I think I bored him with many conversations of the work that we do uh, in the uh, Ubers and cars and taxis and trains and planes. Not, no trains, sorry, planes. Um, and at the same time, during meetings uh, with officials at Health Canada, including the Assistant Deputy Health Minister, uh, witnessed his real compassion and passionate and compelling advocacy for the urgent need for federal investments in Canadian science and Canadian scientists, both for now and for the future. And this is a huge, huge challenge for us, as, as we all know in the academic field, is ensuring uh, that we not just maintain, but that actually uh, improve um, the uh, federal investment uh, across the country. He's inspiring, he's visionary, he's a clinician, a teacher, a communicator, and a wonderful human being. So um, with, with that, I really thank you again, uh, uh, Zulfi, for accepting the 2023 prize, and uh, we'll pass it back uh, to uh, Bernie. Thanks. Okay, so it is with great pleasure that we welcome Dr. Zulfikar Buta to Waterloo this morning. Um, just a little bit more biographical information, because <laughs> we can't resist. It's so wonderful. Dr. Buta is a distinguished university professor and founding director of the Institute for Global Health and Development Center of Excellence in Women and Child Health at the Aga Khan University. He also holds the Robert Harding Inaugural Chair in Global Child Health at the Hospital for Sick Children and is the co-director of Sick Kids Center for Global Child Health. He has received numerous awards over the years, most recently being recognized by the Senate of Canada with its Canada 150 Medal for contributions to global child health, admitted to the National Academy of Medicine and elected as a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. He was awarded the Rue Prize in 2021 for his work on evidence-based public health impact and is a recipient of the 2022 John Dirks Canada Gairdner Global Health Award. He's ranked among the top 100 medical science, uh, scientists globally by ResearchCom. Please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Buddha for the Friesen Lecture. <laughs> <laughs> 
quickly. I think this is now much better. Thank you. Uh, what are the lessons that we need to learn from the transition from the Millennium Goals to the current situation? I will spend a little bit of time on describing and measuring inequities. Why do we do some of the indicators that we have for, and you've already had a discussion in the panel on, for example, gender inequality as, as one measure. I will talk about opportunities for reducing inequities. What do we know works? And I'll also, from our own work, perhaps try and illustrate where we think we can do better, or what are the don'ts of uh, trying to reduce inequities without focusing on some of the fundamental issues. And, and then hopefully we'll be able to conclude in terms of moving forward. So yesterday was <clears throat> Martin Luther King Day. And many people globally who recognize him as a great champion for human rights and particularly um, the justice around color and some of the rights for African Americans, uh, don't quite recognize that he also said many important poignant things for justice and equality across the board. And one of the statements that's often misquoted uh, was this statement that he made um, in 1966 when talking about inequality in health, not health care as this is often cited. And what Martin Luther King said was that inequality and injustice in health was most shocking and most inhuman because it was often associated with mortality outcomes. Now this is well before all of the work that's come out on the relationship of some of these inequities and hard outcomes like mortality, dallies, and other measures. But this was way ahead of its time and people did not quite understand what he was alluding to. At the time when we picked up some of the challenges around global health, when the world signed up the Millennium Development Goals in the year 2000, some of us got together a year or two later to look at child survival in the context of the MDGs targets. This was before MDGs were even recognized as a, as a valid global mandate because it was focused on LMICs, it was imposed, it was not developed through a democratic process of negotiation and consultation. So when we got together in Bellagio to look at this in the year 2002, we drew this map. And this is one of the most influential infographics that have been drawn ever on child mortality. This is the clustering of the 10 million estimated child deaths across the world under five. And as you can see, the bulk of these deaths were in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, and South Asia. And they're both inherently different because of the density. When you take population density into account, South Asia comes out as a red blob and Africa follows. And this is where almost 90% of the global burden of premature under five mortality was clustered. What we were also able to put together through the evidence that was available at that time was that we could do something about it. And we said that we had the knowledge and we had the interventions that we thought would work that could save close to around two thirds of these child deaths as we spoke. And this was hugely influential in accelerating change in relation to the MDGs. And I think we need something similar for the sustainable development goals now, is some optimism that the world could make a difference. So the MDGs, to those in the audience who may or may not remember, were eight global targets, of which the most important ones were the goal four for reducing child mortality by two thirds and goal five of reducing maternal mortality by three quarters. Now, because of that impetus, so the so-called second child survival revolution, you know, where people had lost hope that they could do something about child mortality as it stood, the 10 million deaths that we had, we had estimated were happening worldwide in the year 2000. If you look at what's happened since and what happened in the MDG period, uh, it's amazing what was achieved. So if you take the MDG period and you take the 1990 base figure, which was around 12.7 million deaths in children under five. By 2015, that figure had been brought down to just under six million. And if you take the global population increase into account, then ostensibly the world met 
the MDG4 target of reducing child mortality. This was the fastest rate of reduction in child mortality in the recorded history that we have over the last several centuries. And this happened because the world did get together. The world had a bit of optimism that it could achieve this change by plausible, affordable, available interventions and policies. Now, we were fortunate this was all happening at a time when immunizations were kicking off. A big chunk of this was through the availability of immunizations worldwide and strategies such as the Global Vaccine Alliance, which got them to countries who needed them most, the poorest of the poor. But it happened because there was the advocacy, the impetus, and evidence-informed policymaking. But let's try and unscramble this a little bit and see if it truly was as astounding an achievement as I think this graphic shows. So if you look at the distribution of where these child deaths reduced globally, you begin to see that it wasn't equal in all geographies. In fact, if you look at this closely, the bulk of this change was because of changes in China, in Latin America, and in parts of the Middle East. So these were countries where a lot of the mortality reduction accelerated, and they together brought the global average and numbers down. But there were many parts, as you can see here in Africa and South Asia, where the mortality reduction wasn't as high as other places. So there was that difference in terms of acceleration and rates of change. And this was visible to people who were looking at numbers, but not everybody looks at numbers. So one of the persons who looked at the numbers and made this observation in 2010 was the newly minted executive director of UNICEF, who, by the way, to, for people who think that it's only professionals who can bring about change, actually came from a very different background. So Tony Lake, who became the executive director of UNICEF in 2010, actually was a former head of the CIA. And he came into power, and he wanted to see what UNICEF was doing, and he made this observation within a few weeks of holding office. I think this is one of the most startling, uh, uh, stark demonstrations of an understanding of what he was facing. So he said, when you disaggregate these successes and data, you find that they are statistical national successes mask tremendous moral and practical failures. And what he was alluding to is these people, families, children who are left behind on the basis of race, color, ethnicity, geography, or whether or not they lived in a safe zone or an unsafe zone. Now, a lot of people didn't quite understand what, what he was talking about. But it is very important to recognize that you could lose the plot completely until you disaggregate information and see who's benefiting and who's not benefiting. Let me try and illustrate this with this cartoon looking at child mortality change during the same period that we are talking about in relation to whether or not countries observed mortality reduction with a reduction in inequality or without a reduction in inequality. So look at this upper quadrant here. On the x-axis are countries who have reduced mortality. On the y-axis are those that have done so with an increase or a decrease in inequality. So obviously, there are some green dots here, countries that have done both. But these red countries are the countries which have had a reduction in mortality in children, but an actual increase in inequality, the distribution of mortality by measures of inequality. A lot of people don't understand how this happens. My students frequently ask, how can this happen? And this can happen, as I will show you, because sometimes people who get access to services do not necessarily represent the majority. This is how the GDP per capita average income of a country can go up just because the top 1% happen to be the richest people in the world. And they pull the average up without necessarily those averages reflecting on the distribution of assets and income. And that's extremely important to recognize that you will not see that from just looking at average measures.
This was one of the major reasons why when the sustainable development goals and particularly health and health related sustainable development goals were being crafted, that some of us put a huge amount of noise and effort in making sure that goal 10 of reducing inequalities was there as an individual goal, not as something which was you know, buried or cross-cutting here and there, that we had an explicit goal in the SDGs of reducing inequalities. So let's now turn to this more specifically by asking ourselves, how do you measure it? How, if inequalities are such a big target, how do you measure it? And one of the first questions that again arises, and I get asked this all the time in my own team, is what is the difference between inequalities and inequities? And these terms are used by many scientists, people, public health policymakers interchangeably. And they're not the same. Although they represent some of the same principles, but they're not the same. And, and this was recognized way back in 1999 in this document that I'm referencing to here. So health inequalities are sometimes the reality of life. I mean, you have differences because of where you live, who you are, if you are you know, uh, uh, representing a certain uh, subgroup where you don't have access to the same resources, social conditions, they are unfair and they can be reduced by the right mix of government policies, provided you recognize them. But while inequality represents differences between individuals or population groups, inequities typically represent the unfairness of inequalities. So in simple terms, inequity is an unfair inequality. And that's extremely important to recognize because that principle of justice, social justice fairness, is what underlies policies to redress some of this change. So while not all inequalities are unjust, all inequities are products of unjust inequalities. And that's one of the reasons why we place special attention on looking at how social determinants of health and some of these social cultural contexts underlie many of the differences that we see in access to care and health outcomes. And nobody knows more about this than those who study indigenous health in this very country. Okay, how do we measure this then? So one of the ways that you measure inequities is by looking at coverage of interventions. In maternal and child health, I chaired the countdown process for you know, 13 years. This is what we started off by doing, constructing what we call these Manhattan plots. So these are coverage of a range of life-saving interventions across the continuum of care. Each one of these dots represents a country. And the size of the band represents the median value. So you could look at this and say for these 100 plus low middle income countries where we are measuring change over time, the tremendous differentiation between countries and differences in terms of coverage of interventions. So one way of doing that is to look at coverage. The other way that we've tried to do that at times is to do heat maps. And heat maps show you across a, a coverage continuum how different countries are behaving. And one of the measures that you use is the so-called composite coverage index here on the y-axis which is a combination of, of some 10 indicators that you club together and see how is the average performance in a particular country or a geography related to achievement at a certain level. And you begin to see the gradient, that you see countries that are doing very well, their countries are doing well for some of those interventions, and others which absolutely fall through the cracks. But what policymakers are often very interested in is to look at in relation to cost of living or income groups. And that's been a very big challenge in global health because like here, nobody actually tells you their true income or, or their spending power. Uh, so internationally for many surveys, the way we got around this is to say in order to measure uh, wealth related inequalities in household surveys, we would look at what we call asset indices. And this looks at 
the distribution of assets across an entire sample on a scale that you're able to then use to classify a particular population into various quintiles or various subgroups. So as you can see, whether or not you're living in a well-off place or another, you are able to look at assets as a means of the distribution pattern within a given population and look at, therefore, the equality or inequality of assets as a measure. And this has been shown over time to be reasonably robust, perhaps not as much as comparing between various countries, but certainly within a particular population clustering uh, to look at the difference between haves and have-nots. And I will show you several examples as to how this has been applied. So the way this is done is usually in demographic and health surveys and now increasingly with multiple indicator cluster surveys that use the same instrument for looking at assets. And over time, our calculation of assets has changed. There was a time earlier on where cell phones didn't matter, but now they do. Um, whether or not you possess a refrigerator matters, whether you have access to information system like a television or internet. So over time, these definitions are also evolving. But they're very useful because you can compare between populations, and you can compare populations by various outcomes. So for example, this is work, and I'm going to cite very heavily from the work of my close friend and colleague, Cesar Victora from Brazil, who has looked at this objectively from his International Health Center in Health Equity. So here we are looking at the wealth indices by the poorest to the richest quintiles that you see up here in relation to a range of outcomes. So child mortality under five, stunting in children, and newborn mortality. And we didn't quite know that it would pan out this way. We expected that there would be a gradient of mortality that the mortality would be lowest in those who were relatively rich and would be very high comparatively in those who were very poor. But look at what happens to newborn mortality. And what's the interpretation here? The interpretation at the time when we did this a few years ago was that in most low and middle income countries, access to quality newborn care was not there even for the relatively well off. And therefore, the difference or the gradient between mortality amongst the rich and the poor was not as steep as you have for under five mortality. And that's been a very important observation for the lag that we have had in reduction of newborn mortality across the world in low and middle income countries. It's been the slowest to change because it's been very difficult otherwise. You can also look at some of these gradients in another way, not as quintiles, but you can do deciles. You put 10%. Do the great, and you find that you begin to see the dispersion a little better in certain geographies where it is actually the bottom 10% or the bottom 20% who are the worst. In other places, that difference between the deciles may not be as steep as you would like. For example, Latin American and Caribbean gradient of these deciles is not as great as you have in parts of Africa. And that's where the ultra poor come in, or the difference between top and bottom inequality. You can also be very smart and do some intersectional analysis, or double disaggregation, as I say, and look at the differences between groups by residence. For example, we were very interested to see if the gradient in the urban poor for certain things, in this particular instance for institutional delivery, was just as great or as steep as rural poor. And this is because many of these urban big city people have slum dwellings who, who really don't have access. And you begin to see this for these two examples that I show here, that the difference between Guatemala and Peru is that the gradient in the urban population is not very steep. No difference is not huge between the rich and the poor. But look at what the urban poor face in Guatemala. And, and that also reflects, to a certain extent, the, the way services are distributed in urban populations. One big way that this would have helped policy is if this kind of analysis would have helped targeting. So the difficulty that we encountered as part of our countdown work is that although this is very good as an academic exercise and is telling people that there are differences, systematic or otherwise, between populations, it is 
not necessarily operationally friendly to the policymaker. Because policymakers are generally interested in where are these bottom quintiles. And sometimes they know because they live in geographically distinct clusters or populations, but at times they're interspersed. So in our field of vaccinations, for example, childhood immunizations, we recognize that about 20% of the children are unimmunized in many geographies. In some places, about 30% or more. Zero dose children, as they are called now, euphemistically. But the problem with that 20% is, or every fifth child who is not immunized, is that fifth child is not standing next to the fourth child. So unless you have a means or a mechanism or a measure of identifying who's not being covered, the socioeconomic gradients don't necessarily tell you operationally how to best target and how to influence change. So we looked at alternative strategies. And one of the strategies, again, you know, our collaborators in Stanford, Marshall Burke and our others used, was to try and look at this through the lens of geospatial uh, assessments. And geospatial assessment, as in this case in Africa for child mortality, actually begins to tell you that there are hot spots where you would need to accelerate change because they are clustered in certain geographies which have distinct characteristics. And if you look closely at this first map that was drawn by Marshall and Iran Ben David when they looked at this, was that these clusters often cross administrative boundaries. Even though the surveys may be restricted to a country, but there are ecological uh, characteristics of those populations as they were able to show here, things like conflict, things like climate, that influence the clustering of mortality. So geospatial methods are emerging as an important measure that allows you to target. But then there are other things which are painful, difficult to do. And even in this country, we don't have adequate data on which to assess how things change. So one of the lessons, Khalid is here, that we've been struggling with post-COVID in Canada compared to other places like the US and United Kingdom is how much of the differential was related to things like ethnicity. Because some things are just not available in the public domain. And they are extremely important. So let me show you another measure that Cesar and his team developed called ethnoplots or ethplots, where when you look at the same gradient, but not by socioeconomic characteristics, you look at this by ethnicity. So here is neonatal mortality for a range of countries, looking at mortality rates on the x-axis here at the bottom, and obviously the highest mortality is on the right side, and countries. And in almost every country, the lowest neonatal mortality is in the most dominant ethnic and when you go to the ethnic minorities, you begin to see the spread of neonatal mortality rates that goes from three to five folds higher. Now, obviously, some of those ethnic minorities are also representing geographic clustering, but many a times, as my friends from Africa would know, that these represent marginalized populations that are living right under your nose. So until you disaggregate this information, you are not going to be able to find it. My group has done a lot of work in Afghanistan. We always found differences by language and ethnicity. We were almost never allowed to publicize it because of its political connotation. So it is difficult at times, but it's absolutely essential for programming and action. So let me summarize some of this part of my talk on the drivers of inequities. Uh, uh, by saying that we believe that these represent systematic differences in the health status of different population groups of interest, and they have significant socioeconomic costs, and therefore they're important to address. Some of these are related to structural discrimination. What my friends were talking about, gender inequalities related to cultural factors, and at times uh, uh, the, the absolutely obsequious nature of those differentiations on the basis of tribal law or religious law. They also represent social factors such as employment level, income, education, 
and ethnicity. And these are things that can be redressed in policy through targeting or addressing through other measures. But one of the fundamental causes of these structural and social inequalities is also poverty. And we find that this tracks very closely with many of the other structural differentiators that almost inevitably you find that inequities have underlying them economic deprivation and lack of access to resources that influence choice and interventions. So how can we make a difference? What are the strategies that can reach the poor at scale? And there are many options. And I, in the interest of time, I'm only going to be able to show you some examples. So you know, one can address this through health and safety nets. You could try and create demand and develop outreach services, particularly for marginalized populations. I'll give you some examples of that. You can try and link through this process communities with facilities in terms of, of both a push and pull mechanism. And you can also recognize the importance of measurement. And I'm going to spend some time with because the eye does not see what the mind does not know. If you don't have these measures, if you don't know what you're dealing with, you're almost always unlikely to develop solutions to this. So the World Health Organization, before we all stood still, had come up in the, ten, in the first tenure of uh, its current uh, director general with the principle of universal health coverage. And I think it's important for every student or faculty member in this audience to recognize this cube, which I think is still a very useful way of looking at how do you make services available at a population level? And I'm going to be talking about many things that influence this cube. So if you take it through the lens of available resources for health, and you want to expand this cube to reach the entire population, you want to extend the benefit of what you're doing to those who are currently uncovered, all of what I was talking about in terms of marginalization. To do that, you need to include additional services that those people are not receiving. And many people don't have access to services that impact particularly catastrophic health expenditures. In many populations, people may have access to vaccinations. People may have access to some basic services. But sure as heck, you need surgery. You need cancer treatment. Or you need a cardiovascular procedure, you fall through the cracks because there's almost never resources to address those things. That was one of the reasons why in the Millennium Development Goals, you will not see a single sentence talking about non-communicable diseases because they were thought to be unaffordable by health services. So that's the services coverage that you need to increase. And then, of course, you need to do that by making those services affordable and increasing the resource allocation. Now, my big fight with WHO at the time when we were doing this was they did the whole UHC framing without a single mention of women and children. And our fight was you can't dispense or discard the entire MDG process and just saying that we do this for a population and women and children will be covered. They might, but if you want to do more health for the same money, it might be done at the cost of services for women and children. And that's exactly what's happened. I mean, I taught at fights in the corridors of the World Health Assembly around this issue of how we should still keep the focus on what we should have done as part of the MDGs. That fight still continues. But what I didn't know at that time, and many of us didn't, was that the world will indeed come to a standstill with COVID, and it did. And it also tells you that in addition to women and children, you've got to have other preparatory measures, you've got to have pandemic preparedness, you've got to invest in things that are important for national policy. All right, so what interventions did we look at in the context of addressing um, care for the poor and reducing inequities? One of the big things worldwide was this intention, attention towards conditional cash transfers, which came out of the exper experience and experiments in Latin America, what we call CCTs. They can be conditional or unconditional. But they were considered very useful to remove financial barriers <coughs> in the context of services. And one of the biggest experiments earlier on in this in South Asia was this JSY program in India. There was a cash transfer program that was put in India 
Um, in 2005, largely federally funded, and the idea was to incentivize women with money to deliver in a facility. So if you went and delivered in a facility rather than at home, you were given an amount of money in different stages, and the health worker who was working in that region was also incentivized to refer you. And at the time when this was allocated, it had a very modest allocation of about $300 million at that time. Now it has a much greater allocation. And people thought it would fail. I was one of those people who reviewed the project and thought that, you know, this has no hope in heck because, you know, you can't just pay people to do this. And I was wrong. I mean, it caused huge change within a relative short period of time in terms of distribution patterns of who was delivering where. So just see the change in color in some of the middle and northern states of India in terms of people who are receiving JSY and delivering in facilities. And you see these differences in the various states of India in terms of uptake at state level, with many states receiving a disproportionate share of the JSY allocation. At the time when this was evaluated for the first time, one big question was, is it making a difference? And the evaluations were mixed because you know, you did not have the same quality of care in those facilities to cater for a lot of these births that were taking place. But the early evidence suggested that maybe it was making a difference to outcomes like stillbirths and perinatal mortality uh, because you were delivering them in facilities where you could provide an operative intervention, like a cesarean section. Now, over time, we've recognized that this was not sufficient on its own that India needed to make a tremendous amount of investment in quality of care in facilities to reap the real benefit of delivering in facilities. But be that as it may, just like our experience in Pakistan, two things have happened. One is the recognition that with this increase in institutional births, you could take this incentive away tomorrow and people will not go back to the traditional birth attendance. Once you have a process of change and reasonable quality of care being delivered in facilities, those behavior changes are reasonably robust and they stand. So in terms of sh showing how this could influence things, this conditional cash transfer program in India worked because over time, Facility-based births in India from a level of about 50 to 60% max have now gone up to over 90%. So we no longer have to deal with community strategies the same way as we did about 15, 20 years ago. The other aspect which again came out of South Asia largely was this interest in how do we create demand? How do you overcome some of the mental barriers that communities have around care provision, care seeking, or domiciliary care, where you could support some of the improvement in quality by reaching to. And the big work there was done by women's groups. And these women's groups in, in South Asia, Nepal, Bangladesh, India, uh, and Pakistan also looked at impact that they had on hard outcomes. And, and in systematic reviews, overall, almost universally, there's been a reduction in newborn mortality about a fifth reduction in newborn mortality. We looked at this quite extensively as to how that had happened, and we were quite clear in our assessment that a lot of that reduction in mortality was because of improvement in care seeking in facilities rather than in changes in domiciliary practice. So supporting women through these women's groups was also a means of reducing some of the inequities and gaps in coverage. Could you combine them? Could you combine these women's group and outreach services and see change? And so a lot of interest in this as well through the role of community health workers, an area in which my group has done extensive work over the last several decades. And this has been reviewed systematically, both in Cochrane reviews and in WHO. And the bottom line is as follows. When you combine these strategies of outreach and also community mobilization, you begin to see an impact on reduction in mortality to the extent of about 20-25% reduction in newborn mortality, and also the same proportionate reduction in maternal morbidity. So 
these things work, but they have a, they have a ceiling effect. You typically cannot push mortality reduction by these community strategies to figures above 20, 25%. Outside of very intense research focused, led randomized control trials. The moment you go to effectiveness evaluation, where you have human behavior and other things come into place, health system functionality in place, you begin to see the ceiling effect. That's why we need to combine this approach now with improvements of quality of care in health facilities as well. All right, let me now turn to the pitfalls that I've you know, alluded to. So there are several pitfalls, and I will only be focusing on four here. Uh, and one of these is that this task shifting or the use of community health workers will deal with the problem. I've already told you that there's a ceiling effect. But for many policymakers, they've washed their hands of this whole thing and say, well, we've got these community health workers in there, and therefore my task is done in terms of reaching the four. The other is that you increase the coverage level of interventions, and the benefit will take place. It's just like people talk about development and say, you want to take development somewhere, <laughs> build a road, and development will follow. It's a very long process if you really depend upon just secular trends and changes in coverage alone. So we'll talk about that. The third is a very common view. I encounter that in my work with policymakers in Asia and Africa all the time. They say, but it's so difficult to target. Let's just get all the interventions in that we can, and trickle-down will take care of this. It's like trickle-down economics. You know, it works in the eyes of some economists. Doesn't necessarily work in the eyes of others. And then the fourth is the more important one, because this is the one I started off with, is that universal health coverage, for example, somehow is the panacea for reducing inequities. And as I said, you know, I, I have had an opinion on this from the very get-go, and I'll show you why I think this has to be cushioned a little better. OK, let's turn to task shifting. And I'll give you the example of Pakistan, which probably was ahead of the curve in many other countries in developing its own program for community health workers as a means of reducing some of the geographic disparities and mismatch of human resources. So here is what has happened with human resources for health. The two lines at the top are the ones I want you to focus on for now. This is doctors, number of physicians produced in the country. The one below that are the number of community health workers. Pakistan launched one of the first programs. The dip that you see is the post-devolution reduction by senescence in some of these health workers. But you can see that it still is a program that has over 100,000 community health workers. But the lines at the bottom are the ones I want you to see. Not the similar comparable increase in nurses, midwives, and some of the lady health visitors. Now, what, when in 1994, when Benazir Bhutto launched this community health workers program, it wasn't in her or her program manager's wildest imaginations that we would still be talking about this program as the backbone for health services in 2024. These are always measures to bridge the gap, to bridge the coverage gap through outreach services until the time that you get the distribution of health workforce right. Now, the reality today is that the vast majority of these physicians in Pakistan, close to around 80% or thereabouts of all pediatricians and obstetricians, are in a handful of big cities. And the vast majority of coverage in rural areas and rural provinces is left to the devices of community health workers. So what you have effectively then developed, and Pakistan's not alone. It's the same issue in many places. Bangladesh is another example. Ethiopia is another example, where primary health care workforce was developed around these outreach services, where over time, rather than bridging this gap and divide deliberately, this has also been used by policymakers as a means of absolving themselves of the responsibility of distributive justice. To some extent, I can say this for Canada as well, that this is something that should be addressed and should be addressed proactively to make sure that you do not use some of these outreach programs and low-level workers as a crutch 
on which to develop a multi-tiered health service where if you're rich, you have the access to the best specialists in the city. But if you're poor and rural, your want in life is a rural health worker. So, hence my point. Second is just coverage. If you increase coverage, everything will happen. Gaps will reverse and, uh, and things will reach those who reach the most. And this is again, a very important common observation. Now I'll give you the example from my own most recent experience of one of the largest implementation research projects that we've done in South Asia. This is called New Hope Umide No project, which we did between 2018 and 23, just finished a couple of months ago, where we looked at some of the highest mortality districts in the south of the country across three provinces and massive population. I mean, about 12 million population was covered through this. And it wasn't a research project per se, but it was an implementation research project through the government. So we helped the government improve its quality of service delivery in these districts, largely through the Lady Health Workers Program, the program that I know most, the Community Health Worker Program. And, and with some limited efforts at improving um, uh, facility-based trainings at an early stage of the project. And of course, this is a real life evaluation. It was implemented and went through the COVID process and then the you know, crippling floods of 2022. So this is basically what happened in real life. So I'm gonna show you some data that will help make the point as to why just increasing coverage without an attention to who it's reaching and not reaching is not enough. So let's look at a few things. Look at income, asset quintiles. Here, you are looking at the richest versus the poorest here at the bottom. Just take the top, top two quintiles on both sides. And almost universally, for many of the interventions, the change in coverage was highest for the relatively rich across these 10 districts. Everybody benefited. So notice that the poor also had a 20, 30% increase in coverage. But the coverage increase was higher for those who were relatively well off. Then we also want to look at this by education. And clearly here again, if the mother was educated, her ability to partake of those interventions was greater than if the mother was not educated. So hence my point that when you implement these things, people who will benefit from these large scale implementation of interventions are by default going to be those who are better endowed to up uptake them, either on the basis of wealth or on the basis of education or on the basis of where they live. And this is recognized and is called the inverse equity hypothesis. Which, which you know was first stated by Tudor Hort in 1979, and then you know seen by Cesar, and confirmed by us. And it says basically that when you take an intervention into a new population, and you put it in, the people who will benefit from it generally first are those who are socially advantaged, economically advantaged, have better access. Unless you have a mechanism of trying to put it in place in the poorest regions and in amongst the poorest people who may need it more than others. And this was the reason why at the time when this whole observation was made that people said, well, WHO said that this is a reflection of what needs to change over time and you try and get coverage levels to 90% plus and everything will fall in place. Of course, everything will fall in place. But most countries are not able to get 90% plus coverage rates for interventions outside of very left-wing primary care policies as we saw in Central Asian states. Most places get up to 50, 60% coverage for many interventions. And that's where some of this inequality is the widest. So I think one needs to be aware of this in terms of what needs to be done. And just to make my case, in our work, the other observation that we've made is that distance matters. That if you live more than 50 kilometers from a district headquarter or hospital, your coverage levels achieved are the least compared to those if you were living within 25 kilometers of a hospital. So obviously for our work, this has huge implications in terms of next steps and what needs to be done in influencing coverage for areas which are far away
which are remote and rural. But as I said, in most instances, this is not what program people do for policymaking. Now, targeting may be challenging in many ways, but unless you do it in this way, you sometimes will not be able to see the impact and you miss out on the opportunity to make an effect. Let me show you this with another example. So in our work on global exemplars, we have looked at a range of countries uh, where we have looked at stunting reduction in children over time and what drove that through you know, a very sophisticated mixed method study. A number of these countries have been done. Uh, and you will see that in most of these countries that we've done, these are the first five that we've published, the stunting reduction is pretty impressive over time. Generally, does, you do not see this kind of change within 20 years. And here are countries achieving an average rate of change of stunting reduction by 3%, 4%, 5% per annum within 10, 15 years. Now, how did they do it is a different question. But let's look at one simple question. Did this stunting reduction impact everybody equally? Or were they able to achieve this by reducing inequality as well? And what we didn't know at the time when we set the study off is that that's not necessarily the norm. That in Kyrgyz Republic, which was a former Soviet, you know, uh, Central Asian uh, Republic, there was a reduction in equity, the gap in stunting rates between poorest and richest. You also saw that in Peru, which had a very pro-poor policy, but in every other exemplar country, Nepal, Senegal, Ethiopia, you actually saw a reduction in the gap between the rich and the poor. Now obviously, had these countries or policymakers known this data, they might have put things in place to reach the relatively poor remote rural population. Peru was able to reduce inequity because it targeted its programs towards those living up in the mountains, the, the, the Andes, where people had both food insecurity and deprivation. Now, could you do this together? So the big question is, can you combine outreach and targeting and therefore achieve change over a period of time which is realistic and reasonable? Now, I believe that you can. And let me give you this example um, from this body of work that actually just been published today. It's about eight years of work that has taken us some time because it's an implementation research project. I mean, it's not a trial. And generally, you know, you have to wait on these projects for a while. So this is a big project on immunizations in Karachi, in the insecure districts of Karachi, which will have a cumulative population of about 7 million. And it'll give you an example. This is one of the first where we tried to see if we could use, and we were wise to it after the first phase of the project, targeting on the basis of clustering of various groups on the basis of ethnicity, on the basis of other deprivations, or on other gradients, such as social marginalization. So in the first phase of this project, when we began, uh, and this was dependent upon serial surveys, and I just want you to look at the impact on zero-dose children. Uh, uh, we were able to show differences between baseline and endline, but the gap remained. And when we saw this for the first time, we said, well, why isn't inequity reducing? Why, why aren't we able to bridge this equity gap? In the next phase, we were able to show this in Karachi, that you could target on the basis of the geospatial stuff that I'd shown you, and that over a short period of time, which basically was three years here, you could reduce this gap in terms of unimmunized children between the rich and the poor to a large extent, and ob obviously also see a consonant improvement in fully immunized children. Maybe not as much as we would have hoped, but by the time we concluded this, two years ago, you can see how targeting at population level can actually achieve this in a diverse, multicultural, multi-ethnic, insecure population setting of Karachi. So these things do work, but they only work if you are aware of the problem and you're able to deal with this in a substantive way. 
The last example that I want to show you is from the universal health coverage experiment in Pakistan, which is again a real life experiment where the last government in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, which had the benefit of having a minister of health who was also the minister of finance. Isn't that an ideal combination? <laughs> so he was, Temur uh, Jagada, he was able to put in practically uh, a concept that had been developed by preceding governments of having a health insurance card. This is called Sehat Sahulat card. Let's say, call it a health coverage card. But what he did very ambitiously was that he gave it to everybody. The entire population of the province was covered with this health insurance scheme. And a significant you know, uh, amount of money was laid out, one million per family per year. And lo and behold, what we saw from this big social experiment. Now, they had zero concept, because I've worked with them and questioned them and got the data at the time when they designed this, which was designed through the State Insurance Corporation of equity targets. And that's one of the reasons why the program was built around services and not an adequate mix of preventive and, and curative services. So a lot of the money was spent on surgical procedures. As you can see, close to around 80% of the expenditure was in hospital-based care around surgery. Um, it has had several evaluations. And in the interest of time, I'll just show you the summary from the data evaluation done by Aga Khan University on this. So it worked because financial risk protection, if you look at those who are using the Sehat card and not using Sehat card, clearly there was significant difference in household spending a proportion of their income on health expenditures, much lower in the case of where they were using health insurance compared to those who are not using health insurance. Also quite recognizable was that you know, they were able to reach the poorest proportion. So the proportion who were using the health card compared to not using the health card in terms of health expenditures, you can see the systematic differences between them. But you also see that how, unlike the vast majority of the users being poor, you have a significant number of relatively wealthy people using the health insurance card. You also see that most of the hospitals that were utilized for services were in the private sector, not the public sector. And be that as it may, I call this a mixed success. I call it a great success because a lot of the pe people who benefited were women who did not get services otherwise. A mixed success because there was no preventive service. A mixed success because it disproportionately benefited the private sector compared to the public sector. And that is all being put in place as this program is being revised in terms of benefits for the future. So this is what I meant by saying universal health coverage is not the panacea unless you put equity at its core. Particularly universal health coverage which will reach everybody will typically benefit those who have better access unless you restrict it either for those who are in the top two quintiles, which may be unfair, but they have other means of insurance, or you disproportionately target some of the people at the bottom, which I think is also fair. So let me conclude, ladies and gentlemen, by saying that my own assessment of this field, and I am by no means the only global expert on this, is that these health inequities around care and outcomes persist, and they've been made worse in recent years as I alluded to in the, in the panel, by these poly crises, conflict, climate impacts, and cost of living. The universal health coverage principles put for WHO are, are right, but they are seriously hampered by a lack of resources, especially by the demand for more health for the money from the poorest countries, because they also have to invest substantially in building disease surveillance systems and putting money into monitoring, evaluation, et cetera, it will go at the cost of primary care. And that's why it's got to come with some ring fence safeguards that they will not reduce their expenditures on maternal child health and preventive services below a certain percentage. I think strategies that are feasible to impact maternal child health in the SDG era are both feasible 
and cost effective, but they need to be based on the solid evidence of what works and program experience of what does not work. And I think this is my closing argument to you, that there is a continued lead, need for learning. And certainly, much more implementation research in real life settings with realist evaluations on what works in those contexts rather than in just pure trials. So let me finish by citing from some of my favorite workers in this field, also economists, and Abhijit Banerjee and, his, his, and Esther Duflo said, the problems of the world cannot be solved by just talking about them. And if you talk about accessible solutions only without redressing them, it's a pathway for paralysis by analysis. And I think, therefore, practically finding ways forward as we deal with the global crisis is really the way to go. Thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm. Happy mm -hmm. to Dr. Buddha, thank you so much for such a fascinating, thought-provoking presentation. I think we have time to take maybe two or three questions. Um, so I'll open the floor for any questions the audience might have. And we have a mic runner um, because we are videoing this uh, presentation. So please. Happy to take comments as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I'll start off. I mean, you know, uh, disaggregation, that was one of the big messages that came through here. And, you know, you can be cynical and say, well, maybe, you know, uh, policymakers and, and governments uh, prefer not to disaggregate because it, it looks better, and, and so that's the cynical view. But what's your view about, you know, kind of um, educating, I guess, and, and sort of, um, yeah, you know, making sure that policymakers understand better the importance of disaggregation when they're making those policies? So, so my sense is uh, that, you know, it's, it's an artificial dichotomy. Mm -hmm. The world of policymakers and the world of academia, civic society, and all. I have often found in my work that if you have civic society engagement and awareness, and the field of journalism in many places now is open, once a problem is identified, you know, policymakers do respond to it. Okay. They do react to it. But the better thing to do is to kind of work with them from the very outset at design stage when programs are being developed to give them a sense of what was the cost of not addressing this. Right. I think right. if you tell politicians, if you don't do this, what do you risk facing in four years, in five years? What if somebody comes back to you and says, you know, you missed this? That to them is a much more compelling argument right. than just the beneficence part of it. <laughs> I mean, I don't believe that politicians have beneficence at heart. Politicians do respond to their constituencies, and they will respond to risk mitigation much more than other things. So uh, in the, I mean, I told you about ethnicity, there is sometimes very little stomach for addressing ethnic, ethnic groups as a, as a means of uh, reaching uh, a large section of the population. But I think people are also very aware in this day and age that nothing stays within, bounder, within your own borders and that sometimes, yeah. sometimes these things come back and haunt you as they have done many countries for a very long time. Other comments or questions? Yes, yeah, Susan. Yeah. So first, thanks so much, Zulfi. And on behalf of geographers everywhere, I'd really like to thank you for underscoring how important geography is to understanding global health patterns and processes and policies. Um, and you talked a lot about the social determinants of health. And like you, I feel very strongly about the role of women and gender and how we can we can address those things in achieving the goals. And we know that, and you illustrated that, uh, mom's education is a strong determinant of the health of their children. And so what are your thoughts about potentially diverting health funding into, for example, educating women as a way to address the health of populations? So, Sue, I, I, I mean, I completely agree. Education is critical, and that's why I resonate. You know, I, I don't know whether you've seen our work from South Asia where we looked at what has happened with COVID on, on girls dropping out and uh, early marriages and what's happened to the whole scenario with school closures. So I'm a great supporter of this. However, I don't think we should divert resources from health to education. I think there are resources to be found 
to address health and education in some of these poorest countries where this is needed. And you would be amazed as to what proportion of national expenditures are spent on things that we could shave and reduce, whether that is defense expenditure or expenditure on reducing imports of <clears throat> frivolous luxury goods. In almost every low middle income country that I've been to, I find you know, cars on the streets which are worth over $100,000. Uh, and I think those are the kind of things that we need to address through uh, generation of resources and taxation. Uh, the other thing that I would say is that for Africa, certainly, and for um, our own geography, particularly my own country, uh, debt servicing and the cycle of uh, principally countries get, getting caught in debt trap where you're spending all your time on just repaying the interest, not even the principal. I mean, that's something that we've got to look at closely in the context of, of the globe because it's going to impact everything, including spending on climate change, spending on disaster mitigation, spending on infectious disease surveillance programs. And I find that countries that are ending up by spending 30 to 40% of their GDP on debt servicing really have a problem because it is a new form, if I may say, yeah. of neo-colonialism where instead of actually putting your own forces on the ground and collecting taxes by force, you force countries through the global monetary mechanism of having no way out but to pay exorbitant interest rates that they were trapped into at one stage. So, so I think there is money to be found, uh, but I wouldn't take it out of the health or other social sectors. Okay, last question. Hi, first of all, I'd like to thank you for providing this really insightful lecture. I learned a lot myself and as a Pakistani, I um, saw a lot of, um, growing up in Pakistan, I saw a lot of cultural and religious stuff holding a lot of women back from accessing a lot of these services. And I wonder like, if you looked at to what extent cultural and religious um, um, obstacles um, that women face, like how much that influenced um, the level of progression that you saw. Extensively. So I've looked at that extensively. And uh, the good news for you is that unlike you know, what many people think from a very perfunctory analysis, culture and religion in terms of gender disparities does not pay, play as much of a role overall as feudalism does. So the worst of parts of the country are where there is feudalism, not necessarily the north and other areas where people think culture and religion play a role. The fastest growing development indicators in the country are from my own province of the north, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, which was always thought to be a very uh, orthodox uh, society. And in several measures of empowerment, uh, women there are, have done very well over the last 20 years, both in terms of education, nutrition, health parameters. So there is obviously there are barriers that are probably more related to the feudal structure of society and serfdom. And there, of course, women do very poorly. And, and as Sue was pointing out, there are also relationships with things like mass deprivation at education level and, and uh, uh, family sizes, uh, access to services, which is particularly the case in Balochistan. But it's not a uniform picture with a single simple explanation. Uh, uh, these are things that change over time, and we are beginning to see that change. Um, one measure in Pakistan that people don't know about is age at marriage. So over the last 20 years, the average age at marriage first birth uh, has gone up by four and a half years. Mm. So it's now 21 and a half, mm. which is not bad at all, yep. actually. How has that happened? Not by legislation or regulation. It's happened through development. And, uh, and general change in both urban and rural po Rural populations were behind, and we know that from the data, but they've all begun to pull up. 
Okay, I would like to thank our visitors again today. Uh, we have, I don't trip over the cords here. <laughs> no tokens of our appreciation. Oh, thank, thank you so much. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank 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 you.